the first thing that I realized was that the more personalized I made the outreach to the journalist, the more likely it was that I would get a response. It seems obvious, but a lot of folks will get a big list and they'll just send the same thing out to everybody. And that's just really a mistake. But there's no reason that you have to sit there and manually write every single email. That's what really led us to, to some success uh, on the PR side of things. We started getting coverage you know, in, in major be- beauty publications. We got in Vogue, we got in People, we got in the New York Times, Huffington Post. And then we started getting on TV. We got on Good Morning America and we did about 120 grand in sales in a single day. We did. We made more money on the retargeting ad, almost 2x the amount of money on the retargeting ad than we did on the initial day of sales. We stand today. The Business Method the business with method. the Shadow. The Business Method. The Business Method Podcast. The Business Method Podcast featuring Chris Reynolds. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics for location independence. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I'm your host, Chris Reynolds, and welcome to the Business Method Podcast, a podcast featuring successful entrepreneurs and high-profile people dissecting their online and location-independent business models. We dissect the different methods, tools, and tactics of high-performance online entrepreneurs and high-caliber people in a series format. On our first series, we interviewed 100 entrepreneurs in 100 days that had built businesses creating $100,000 or more annually. On our second series, we are interviewing 100 entrepreneurs that have built location-independent businesses that generate a million dollars or more in annual revenue. There's a growing movement of people building these caliber of businesses, and we are getting behind the minds, the logic, and the science of what it takes to build businesses like this. On top of that, we also gather entrepreneurs at events and retreats around the world. This October, we are having our annual event in Thailand, Get Shit Done Live. It's 10 days of high-performance productivity, targeted collaboration, and rapid execution designed for entrepreneurs to get a lot of work done in a little amount of time. Some say it's like 10 months of work in 10 days. There's a magic that happens when brilliant minds come together to push one another towards productive execution. That is exactly what this retreat is about. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. That is thebusinessmethod.com now. Let's jump in today's show. The Business Method. Hey listeners, on today's show we welcome Peter Fries, the co-founder of SEO Shower. I was really excited to chat with Peter today because he was referred to us from a highly reputable friend of the show. Peter, with his family, has built SEO Shower into a seven-figure e-com company with a fully remote team. What is really exciting is that Peter was having so much success getting press coverage and using social media advertising to make that coverage skyrocket sales that he decided to create another business is called PR Volt to help other entrepreneurs do this as well. During the episode, Peter chats with us about specifically how he and his teams hack PR to get a ton of media coverage and then use social media to maximize that press coverage. The content was so good during the interview, I was literally taking notes. Another great episode, you guys. Be sure to check out this one. And without further ado, let's welcome Peter to the show. Entrepreneurs, systems, methods, tools, and tactics. Listeners, I'm incredibly excited to welcome the founder of PR Volt on the show, Peter Freeze. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thanks for coming on the show. Where are you calling in from? I'm currently calling in from Delray Beach, Florida, but uh, located most of the time in Santa Monica, California. And why, just a quick question, I know Santa Monica is a hot spot, but um, for all sorts of things that's, that's going on, but why do you choose right. Santa Monica? Well, I just, you know, I, I moved out to, to LA, um, you know, to, to, well, I was working at Amazon uh, up in Seattle and ended up getting, coming down to UCLA to get my MBA. Um, and that brought me down there initially. Um, but I'm just sort of attracted to um, the diversity of Los Angeles as a city generally. Um, there's, there's just a lot going on both in the, in the tech scene, but just, but also, you know, entertainment, uh, manufacturing. A lot of people don't know that Los Angeles is one of the largest manufacturing cities in the world. I did not um, know that. And, and wow. in, in, in the United States. Um, and uh, so there's just, there's just a, a lot of innovation happening from, you know, new media, entertainment, but also uh, tech. And, you know, S- Santa Monica is known as Silicon Beach. So there's, there's a lot of talent. There's a lot of smart folks. And um, there's just, it, it's just, a, it's just a lot of great energy there. Um, love being near the water. I grew up in South Florida. So, um, you know, all things considered, it's great. I don't love the, you know, the cost of living and the taxes, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, you, you sort of pay for, pay for the, pay the, pay the price for the, the premium of, of living in a great place. So yeah, the tax situation in, in California is brutal. I mean, i I know you get an incredible quality of life, right? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I noticed that when I was, I actually did a incorporated in Phoenix of okay. about 10 years ago. And, um, I was looking at, you know, the, the, the different states to incorporate in. Yep. And I noticed that uh, California had some interesting taxes there and it's like, Oh man, that's rough. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they, they certainly make you pay for, for living there and working there. But, um, but it does come with, with a lot of benefits in terms of the talent, uh, you know, that, that you're, yeah. that you're working with uh, the, the, the quality of people. Um, I work out, out of a, we work in, in Santa Monica and there's just, so many smart people there and I'm always able to bounce ideas off of folks. And I mean, you get that in, in co-working places, probably any, anywhere in the world, but there, there really is um, a high level of um, innovation and intellect in, in Santa Monica that I love. So I, I want to dive into you as an entrepreneur and some of the experiences you, ha- you have, but first um, we were a mutual intro from a friend that you met at Fireside Conf. Those guys at Fireside Conf are good friends of mine and I, I have a lot of respect for what they're doing, but I'd like to ask you, you know, briefly about your experience at Fireside Conf and I know you took your whole remote team there and it was the first time you guys met in person. So I'd love for you to share about that for a minute if you don't mind. Yeah, no. So, so we, we just gotten back a few weeks ago from, from fireside and it was, it was incredible event. Um, like you said, uh, it, it was actually the first time my team physically was together in the same place. Um, and we've been, you know, operating and working together for the last year and a half getting, you know, on Skype calls and, you know, weekly, weekly team meetings and, and such, but being in the same place at the same time was actually a really cool, um, experience. We, we all flew into ter- Toronto and met at, you know, met in the airport, hopped in a car, did a three and a half hour you know, road trip, listen to Celine Dion all the way, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had to get in the Canadian vibes, right? Yeah, um, of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and it was just really cool to have some of that team building, team bonding. Uh, the conference itself was great, but it was also an opportunity for our team to have some of, build some of that camaraderie. We, you know, we swam in the lake, did backflips off the diving board, jumped on a trampoline, went in an escape room, you know, get, did an escape room in a treehouse, And, you know, all these things that you, you sort of forget about when you're a remote distributed team that are, that are actually fairly important, um, to, to building sort of some, some bonding and, and, uh, you know, team, uh, camaraderie. So, um, that was great. And then I think just, uh, fireside itself was a really cool, um, you know, experience, uh, overall, um, we, we, so my company PR Vault helped, helped do the, the, um, the PR for the event, but, um, just even beside that, it was, it was really cool to sort of disconnect. I think the sort of the tagline is disconnect to connect. Um, and so, so there was really, there was no cell phone co- coverage. There was no Wi-Fi except for one, you know, small little room that had Wi-Fi. but, um, generally we avoided that place <laughs> because it's nice to just, you know, be away from, every, you know, everything for a bit. And that really f- created and facilitated, um, you know, an experience where it was all about talking to the person next to you in in a more real way than if you're at a typical conference where you're networking and sharing business cards and all that. And it really was like, you know, stumbling from one campfire to the next and seeing what people were talking about and what, what cool things people were working on. Um, and like I said, I, I didn't share a single business card at the whole event. Um, but I still met a ton of great people and the connections that I made are probably stronger than you would make at a typical uh, conference. So, um, highly recommend, um, fireside. It, it was a great experience. It, you know, definitely challenged, challenged you to get out of your comfort zone a little bit, you know, camp doing a little summer camp when, you know, um, I'm a little bit of a creature comfort person, but you know, it was, it was great overall. I, I really had an, an incredible time there and Daniel, um, and Steve did a, did a great job, job with, uh, executing the event. Now I hear about more and more companies that take their remote employees, even non-remote employees to events like this. And it's an incredible bonding experience. I'm curious, did you get any feedback from, from your team? Did they, what, what was their experience like? Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. I mean, I think everybody really enjoyed um, having that opportunity. Um, it, it strengthened our, our the, the bonds that we have, and I I just noticed like you know in Slack and and in our team meetings now, people are a little more comfortable cracking jokes and you know <laughs> bringing up things that that we did at at, at Fireside, and uh, it just I think it creates a little more. Um, comfort comfort zone for people to be transparent to to really own up to you know if you make a mistake it's not the end of the world like we're there for each other right like those team building things that we did at fireside helped us know that we've got each other's backs um 
And definitely the, the rest of the team, I think, felt felt that way as well. And our plan is to, to, to try to do that a few times a year now because I think it, it really um, did strengthen um, our team bonds. Do you have any thoughts on other destinations or events that you might do? Well, <laughs> we, we were thinking, uh, you know, this wasn't quite remote enough for us in Canada. We were thinking about going, you know, up, up, up all the way towards, uh, the, the Arctic. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> with we, the igloos and Eskimos, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, we haven't, no, to be honest, we haven't, we haven't figured out the, the next location. Um, but, uh, we, we talked a little bit about, uh, Telluride, um, oh, yeah. cause, cause Joey, um, who's our director of sales, um, he, he spent a lot of time in Telluride. I've, I've been to Telluride a few times and it's just a great vibe there and they have a lot of uh actually a lot of cool you know entrepreneurs there too and a lot of innovation there um and some really great festivals and conferences so that's one that we're we're potentially a place that we're potentially looking at but we haven't really nailed it down yet yeah there's something about telluride that's a special little town yeah i I think it's an incredible location now are is your team all north american based we are all well not not 100 percent. so um so our director of sales is based out of Dallas, um, and our director of client campaigns, who oversees all of our camp- team of campaign managers, she's based out of Chicago, and then our director of operations is based out of Brazil. Um, okay. She's American, but she lives in Brazil. So we definitely totally um, encourage the remote working, and yeah, you know, I, I, I work like I said, I work out of an office in Santa Monica, and we work and don't have any of my team members near me. Um, and it, it, it hasn't affected us in terms of productivity, but I, like I said, like the fireside experience was really sort of, you know, a, a mind shift and, and, and really woke us up to the idea that it, it is sometimes really cool to, to be together in one place. So yeah, I think it's really beneficial. I've even heard of companies just taking a month to go somewhere yeah. and just pound out a ton of work, you know, they'll yeah. have fun and just get a ton of work done and then go back to their you know, regular lives. And they do that yeah. once a year. Yeah, get an Airbnb somewhere and just bang it out or go somewhere remote, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah totally. Yeah. So let's talk more about you as the entrepreneur that you are. And you've got a really cool resume here. I mean, you have a seven figure e-com business and mm-hmm. then you've evolved PR Volt out of some of the experiences that you, yep. you have getting press coverage and yep. doing really well with it. And you're now running two businesses at the same time, which is a new experiment for you, but you've got some good tips about that. When did you start your econ? Oh no! First, I want to ask you worked for how long did you work for Amazon? I worked for Amazon for just about four years. Um, how from, was the experience? Yeah, so um, so Amazon is here's how I put it. Um, it I, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't not do it again because I learned a lot and it was it was very challenging and I met a lot of smart people that I'm still connect, you know, connected with today that I, that I really cherish those connections. Um, but Amazon really pushes, pushes people. Um, and, and it's not a place for everybody. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if you remember, but a year or two ago, there was the, there was that New York times expose on, on sort of how Amazon kind of abuses their employees. And there is some truth to that. I mean, uh, it, it just isn't the, it isn't the place for everybody because they, they push you and expect you to be on your game all the time, even when you're not at the office. Mm-hmm. Um, it obviously depends on what team you're on. I was on a very high growth team. I was working on the digital video business, um, which is now part of, you know, prime. So, um, if you've ever rented or streamed a movie on Amazon or a TV show on Amazon, that was the, the group that I was with. And it was really small that when I started there, there was about 10 people, maybe it's 15 people on the Whole, whole team and now it's several hundred so um if not thousands um and uh but the, yeah the, the, the culture is tough i mean you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and sort of get in you know in the weeds all, all the time and um just you know that that sort of expectation that you sh- you always be on it is something that not everybody can take. I mean, the turnover at Amazon is very high. Most people don't don't last a year. Um, and there's this thing at Amazon called the old fart tool, um, <laughs> which, which is you can basically plug in your start date um, for when you started, and it'll tell you what percentile you're in. You know, so by the time I left, you know, about four years, I was in I think at the 98th or 99th percentile wow. um, of so of longevity. So it, it, it is a tough place to survive that. But like I said, like it really trained me. To, to learn how to work within teams. You know, I, I worked with some really talented uh, engineers and developers and understanding, you know, sprints and, you know, scrums and all that stuff. And um, just just learning, 
you know, how, how to roll out products. And, and also I was mo- mostly in charge of the marketing and, and PR side of things. So, um, working on you know, several major product rollouts, um, was, was pretty cool to, to watch happen. All right. Let's chat, chat about your entrepreneurial career. Were you, yeah. did you start your business while you were at Amazon or did you step away first and decide you wanted to test the entrepreneurial waters? Yeah, so the the whole so so my my e-commerce company is SEO Shower E S S I O Shower dot com and it's a family business. Um, my my mom came up with this idea for a product that would install in your shower and create aromatherapy in the shower. So diffusing essential oils like lavender, peppermint, eucalyptus, really nice. creating like a spa like experience in the shower. Um, she had this idea because she's a busy saleswoman, you know, you know, always on the go, never had the time to really go to the spa. And, thought it was crazy that you you, know, you have these bath bombs and everything for the bath, but there really wasn't something that did it in the shower. Um, and most people don't have time to take a bath, maybe don't even have a bath at their house, right? Um, so she came up with this idea, and my dad's an engineer, and she told, told my dad the idea. My dad's like, that's kind of a cool idea. And you know, uh, my sister had recently moved to Australia, so there's an open bathroom in, in the house, and he started you know, tinkering and lo and behold, came up with this product that just clips on any shower and does exactly what my, my mom wanted. Obviously the initial prototype was crude and, you know, uh, didn't look great, but it it functioned. And, um, that was, that was all happening while I was at Amazon, them coming up with the idea, them sort of, you know, um, building some initial prototypes. And then what happened is my dad filed for patents. And by the time I got to business school, the patents came through and business school for me was, you know, very non typical business school experience. I used the whole business school time to sort of flesh out this idea, um, come up with a, you know, launch, you know, plan and, um, do some, um, concept testing, um, and also just, um, proving the concept, I guess, generally. Um, but once we got the, the patents, once those patents came through, then, um, that's when we sort of had some validation that, you know, a, we, we have IP protection, but we'd also done a focus group too. And, and that's when we sort of said, okay, we have people that have tested this, they like it and we have IP protection. Let's, let's try and see if we can launch this thing. So it was really the idea started while I was at Amazon, but, um, the, the initial execution really started happening when I was in business school. Nice. And you started that in 2012, right? Uh, well, uh, we officially sort of launched our Shopify store in 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but I was in business school like 2011, 2013. So, um, it was during that time that we sort of really put the ideas together and we were, we started refining the product. We found a industrial designer. Um, we got the, the product designed in a more aesthetically pleasing way. We found a man, a first initial manufacturer, um, all those things. And then it was sort of shortly after I graduated from business school that we, we launched the, the, the product to the market. Very cool. Where'd you go to school at? Uh, Anderson, at U- the Anderson School at uh, UCLA. Okay, uh, cool. Yeah. yeah. Right on. So throughout this process, while you're growing the, is it S- SEO Shower? Is yeah, that- yep, okay. SEO Shower. Mm-hmm. SEO Shower, cool. Uh, while you're growing it, you guys figured out some really great ways to get press coverage and then maximize and optimize the, the amount of that coverage using uh, social media, which I think find fascinating. I'm wondering if you can dive into how that played out for you guys and then some of the things that you learned throughout that process. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so basically this, this story sort of goes like this. We, we were trying a lot of things in the early days. Um, we really, you know, we had this really cool product. Anytime we showed it to somebody, they saw it and they're like, how, how cool is that? I want to buy one. But there was nobody like, going out and searching for this product. So we had a sort of demand generation problem. We tried selling this thing in spas, hotels, gift shops, you know, in in a lot of different places and we couldn't get, get, get it to scale the way we wanted. Um, but one thing we, we knew is that we, we felt like if we could get this thing, you know, um, in some publications or on TV, we might get some initial traction and generate some, some demand that way. So I, I went the the route that you know everybody said you know if you want to do PR you got to hire you know PR agencies so I, I literally flew to New York City and I met with like you know six or seven of the top beauty PR companies showed them the product and they're like this is great we're gonna get you so much press coverage I was super excited came home you know to, to LA opened my inbox and saw that you know I was, to get said press coverage I was gonna have to pay like ten to fifteen grand a month mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was just like this is crazy right um, and that just was it was something that led me to, I'm a, I'm a very curious person. So I was wondering like, why should it cost so much to do PR? Like what is it exactly that's going on behind the scenes here? And started poking around a little more and got my hands on media lists and started 
um, you know, sending my own pitches to, to journalists and certainly learned the hard way. It wasn't overnight success, but there were two sort of key kernels, um, you know, and, and the, anybody that's doing PR uh, for their company, that this is something that's really important. And I think you, you should, you should pay attention to this, which is, um, the first thing that I realized was that the more personalized I made the outreach to the journalist, the more likely it was that I would get a response. It seems obvious, but a lot of folks will get a big list and they'll just send the same thing out to everybody. And, and that's, that's just really a mistake. So, um, so when I say personalized, I mean, not only just like saying their first name and where they, you know, where, who, who they write for, but, you know, maybe finding the article, the, the most recent articles they wrote and saying how much you like that article, um, th- stuff like that really goes a long way to getting a bet, you know, a higher response rate from the journalist. And that's the initial thing that you want. You want them to respond back you with with interest right so that was the first piece and the second piece is um that's all great but if you if you do things if you personalize every single email um that's going to take a you know forever <laughs> yeah exactly and then you yeah and and so i like to, to scale things and that was seemingly not scalable right and so what we what we did was we actually um we built a, a, a lightweight crm inside the sda shower business to um, do what we now call personalized outreach at scale. And it's just a fancy way of saying, instead of sending five emails a day when you do everything by hand, we could, the things called variables, right? And you plug them in and, and you can um, make, make every single outreach to the journalist feel like 100% personalized, but you're still able to, in, instead able to send 500, 1,000, or 2,000. It's still very important that, that, that every journalist that you're reaching out to be you know, the right and appropriate person and targeted. Um, but there's no reason that you have to sit there and manually write every single email, right? Right. Um, and so taking that combined approach of you know personalizing but doing it at, at sort of high volume was that's what really led us to um, to some success uh, on the PR side of things. We started getting coverage, you know, in in major be- beauty publications. We got in Vogue, we got in People, we got in the New York Times, Huffington Post, and then we started getting on TV. And that's when we, we the you know, the real sales velocity started coming. So we got on Good Morning America. That was a, a huge hit for us. Um, and we did about 120 grand in sales in a single day. Um, and it was, for us, that was amazing. I mean, like we, <laughs> we hadn't done anything like that before. And, um, but that really also was an instructive moment because it was, it, it helped us understand what type of company we were. Um, and we, we stopped messing around with selling this thing in spas and hotels and stuff. And we, we said, okay, we're, we're an e-commerce business and we are a direct response, uh, company. And if we can get our message in front of the right audience at the right place at the right time, um, and send them to a compelling, you know, offer slash landing page, we can drive, you know, pretty good success here. Um, and so what we did was we took that, um, you know, experience with Good Morning America and we said, okay, where can we sort of be on Good Morning America every day? Well, Facebook was the perfect platform, and we started doing um, Facebook ads. We took that audience of people that had bought on Good Morning America, and we created a you know a um, custom audience in Facebook, built out a lookalike audience, um, and started doing doing ads on Facebook. Now, Facebook for anybody that's doing Facebook ads, we we certainly learned the hard way there too. Uh, <laughs> you know, it wasn't just you know we put up an ad and all of a sudden it was you know overnight success. We mm-hmm. we had to learn the recipe that worked for us. And I'm happy to share that. But even if I share that, it may not be the recipe that works for for your, your audience, for all of your audience, because all products and all companies are different. But the, the the bigger point is, you have to test things and you have to give yourself some time to figure things out. Um, and and Facebook is such a powerful channel that for most businesses, it, it should be something that you can get to work. Um, How long did it take your your ads to really take off? From I would say I would say the first. Three months, three to four months, we were losing money, mm-hmm. and then the next three months, we were sort of breaking even. And then after that, we found sort of the recipe for success. Um, so, can I just give you a little brief explanation please, of what that? Please do. Is? So, okay. So the first thing we did when we started launching our ads was we put an image of the product on Facebook, and I laugh at that because we don't ever do any image ads any anymore, really at all. Um, and the problem with the image ad is our product is um, sort of a little bit unique and difficult to understand with just an image. Um, and what we did, we, we had the image ad, and then we were sending people into our website. So neither of those things we do today. Um, what we learned was, um, first of all, video is way more effective for us. Um, so we started running video ads. Uh, we had a video that had been done for us. It was a, like a two and a half minute video. And I had a friend of mine that was a, a very good marketer, and he was having a lot of success with video ads on Facebook. And uh, he said, you, gotta, you guys should try a video. So I, I put our two and a half minute video on 
Facebook and it tanked. And I went to my friend and I'm like, Hey man, like why are you giving me this crappy advice? Like, <laughs> you know, my, my ads are, 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 are worse than the image ads. He's like, let me see your, let me see what you're running. And I showed him the, the ad. He's like, first of all, like people don't have the attention span for two and a half minutes. Uh, and then, and then second of all, your, your video starts with somebody talking for like the first 20, 30 <laughs> seconds before they even show the product. And most people watch ads on Facebook on site. I'm like, oh, face mm -hmm. palm face plant right so yeah. i did the and, same thing so don't feel bad <laughs> yeah and and so then i'm like okay cool let me see if i can cut this thing down cut it down to 60 seconds started seeing improvement in the, in the conversion still wasn't great got it down to basically 20 seconds um and i and and optimized for for basically no sound um so no talking heads just showing the product how it works what problem it solves you know showing the you know the evolution of Put, installing it and then showing somebody enjoying it after it really simple honestly um, and then um, and then the other thing that we that really led to success was not sending the traffic into our website mm -hmm. but sending the traffic into a dedicated landing page and this is something that I think a lot of folks miss especially folks that want to do direct response if you ha if you have a e-commerce store that has you know thousands of products this is a little bit more difficult but if you have a couple key marquee products um, this is to me definitely the way to go. So with the landing page, you build a dedicated page that's all about you know selling your product, and it has one single call to action. With your, if you send people into your website, you've got eight million distractions. <laughs> you know, you've got right. like your your blog, you have like you know your 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 press page, all these different things that can distract people from the one thing you want them to do, which is buy your product. And when you're running paid traffic, you want them to really do the one thing you want them to do. <laughs> um, and so we just, I just super nerded out on landing pages, took the unbalanced training courses, like tried to to learn every single best practice and roll that into, you know, a high punch landing page um, and did all those sort of Cialdini persuasion tactic stuff and, you know, just went for the gut gut kind of thing and um, and combined that with the video ad and we, we saw it was something like a five or six hundred percent, you know, improvement in conversion from where we started, wow. um, which is massive. And that was game changing again for us. Um, so that's sort of a little bit of, you know, what, what we did there. Um, and then I would say, um, with the, with the so w this is where PR came back into the into the things. Once we started just figuring out what worked on Facebook, then we started figuring out, okay, wait a second, what if we ran some of these videos from when we're getting press coverage from you know the doctors from Good Morning America, and we started putting those in retargeting sequences, um, so people would see the initial ad showing the product, and a lot of people would buy straight up on the initial ad. But other folks are like, well, I don't know about this product, right? I mean, who knows, right? Then, like three or four days later, they see an ad, like, wow, SEO showers just on Good Morning America. That, that seems like something maybe I should check out, right? And mm -hmm. it sort of reinforces that social proof. Um, and so, so that uh, when we ran the Good Morning America ad, for example, that did like a um, five or six x return on ad spend over a, like a long period of time, like six months or so. Like it was crazy. Um, and we did, we made more money on the retargeting ad, almost two X amount of money on the retargeting ad than we did on the initial day of sales. Um, so that's something I'm always telling people when, when you're doing, you know, reaching out to press, getting press coverage, don't just, when you get a press hit, don't just stick it on your like, you know, press page where nobody goes, right? Um, use those press hits. You have to use those press hits in your marketing funnel, especially if you can in your ads, cause it really helps conversion. So... It's amazing. Were you pausing on purpose? Are you I'm, pausing. I'm pausing. I'm pausing. <laughs> I take a break. <laughs> okay, dude, that is some in incredible, impressive content. Is there more that you want to share on that? Yeah, I mean, I can give you a little bit of a playbook on the on the landing pages. Um, I'm just going to actually open up our landing page here real quick. Yeah. Um, because I think there's some tidbits here too that might be helpful. I mean, there's just, so a lot when you know a lot of things that go into a, an effective landing page that yeah. again people may miss. One is, you know, really having a strong H1 um, header statement um, that really calls out the benefit of the product. So ours is make every day a spa day, right? Okay, that's you really want to communicate the emotional benefit of what this product does for you. Um, and then we have an H2 that gets a little more specific. So soak in the healing power of essential oils with SCO, the world's first aromatherapy diffuser for the shower. So that makes it a little more concrete. Um, just doing a little tear down on, on the landing page. Um, it's really important to, to call out the benefits of your product very, very clearly. Um, that's something that um, a lot of people will go more features, what the features are, but really stating the benefits in the eye of your, your target customer, right? 
Okay. We layer our page, and I can send you the page also, um, you know, for your audience for your audience after, and you can include that in the show notes. But yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we, we put you know, customer testimonials all the way through. Um, very important that social proof. Um, we do a lot of like anchor pricing stuff. So, um, we want to, we want people to understand that, you know, the alternative to our product is going and spending a couple hundred dollars at the spa that makes our product feel more, have more value. So we have like some of the testimonials talks about how expensive it is to go to the spa, for example. Um, let's see what else. Um, we like to also have, um, not only, um, if you can, this is not, everybody can't do this cause you may not have this, but we have a quote from, um, uh, one of the, um, hosts of the doctors, Dr. Rachel Ross, and that helps from a, um, authority standpoint. So social proof is great, but if it's social proof from somebody that's like, you know, a respected authority that, that really helps. So like a celebrity endorsement or something like that. Um, and then we really go with the, um, we, once you get down to the pricing, um, you know, of, of the offer. We really go with the, you know, scarcity. So it's a limited time offer. Um, there's only a few left, um, you know, and, um, we really try to make it that, that urgency, uh, as, as present as possible. So people feel like they have to take advantage of this now. Cause remember you're paying for that click. You're paying for folks to come into that page. You want to try and get that conversion as much as you possibly can. Um, and then what we started adding on to this is, um, is after they make the purchase, doing some post-purchase um, up, you know, upselling. So um, that really just increases the overall average order value um, that you're able to capture in, in a single session. We, we, we use a product called Carthook for that. Um, shout out to uh, uh, Jordan and the folks at, at Carthook. But um, yeah, so that's that's a little bit of a teardown of the landing page. Maybe hopefully that's helpful, um, you know, for the audience too. I think so. I think, so. I think that was amazing, amazing content that you just shared. And thank you for sharing all that. Oh, um, yeah. Are you guys using just Facebook ads or do you go out to Instagram or maybe Google ads or any other platforms? Yeah. So we do, do we do Instagram also. Um, Facebook has historically been more effective for us because our demo is a little older. Um, but uh, Instagram is also a good platform. Um, we've, we've historically tried um, AdWords and never really gotten it to, to, to work for us. It, it, a lot of it is, I mean, we get the, like the branded terms and stuff like that and, and the very direct stuff like, you know, aromatherapy shower, we can get all, all that to work. But a lot of it is we are really a, a, you know, more of a demand generation than a demand capture product. Like there's, mm-hmm. like I said at the beginning, we're, there's not a lot of folks going out there searching for, you know, aromatherapy showers products. Right. Um, and so we need to agitate the problem a little bit. And that's where a platform like Facebook, where we can show a video showing somebody stressed or showing, you know, a little bit of the, you know, not feeling great when they wake up in the morning and then showing them using our product that really sort of agitates the problem a little bit for the person watching that video. And they say, wow, this is, this sounds like a really cool product, something that I I could use. We sort of have to make them want to discover it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. So that kind of rolls us into the business that you guys have now, PR Volt, which actually helps people do all this, right? Yep. Yeah. So what we found was, first of all, all this, this PR process I built, I built for my, my own e-commerce company. So it was never, you know, there was never at the beginning, any intention of like creating a, you know, a company out of it. It was just like, I want to get press coverage. <laughs> I don't want to pay, you know, 15, 10, $15,000 a month. And there's gotta be a better way to do this. So, so, so we just built out a bunch of processes for it. And what happened was, like I said, we we're getting sort of the snowball effect of press coverage and people in the e-com space that I'm friends with started coming to me and saying, Hey, how are you doing that? What agency are you paying? And we're not paying an agency to do this. Um, and we're just doing it ourselves. And, and people started saying, you know, can, can we use that same system that, that you've built for, for us? And that was sort of a light bulb moment it was like, Hey, wait a second, this is actually a, a pretty big problem. Um, you know, small companies, innovative companies, startups, um, generally a lot of times don't even include PR in their marketing stack because it's too expensive to hire an agency and they don't have the domain expertise to do it in house. And that's, that's actually a shame because a lot of times the, the, the cool products and, and the cool stories are with, you know, young companies. Um, and so what we're trying to do now is with PR Volt, PRVolt.com, uh, we, we try to help um, startups, you know, generate um, press coverage, press interest, you know, at a, at a much more affordable rate than um, what would happen if you were either paying somebody in-house or um, hiring an agency. And we do that by really trying to automate um, first of all, trying to automate the non-value add manual work that, that like would go into running 
your own PR or hiring an agency. So what we found with those PR companies that, that exist, so a lot of them haven't evolved from you know the 1990s mentality and approach to operating their companies, and they haven't u- used automation the way that they should. So like, <clears throat> you know, for example, sending out emails to journalists, um, you know, you send out the first one. Well, if they don't respond, it's called a drip sequence, right? If it, mm-hmm. you know, you send out you know, three or four more. Um, and, and a lot of agencies are still, you know, they've got a you know bunch of interns writing these things by hand, and it's just crazy. Um, so so using automation to to sort of trim off a lot of that non-value add um, manual work. That's sort of step one. And then it's like, hey, how can we use AI and, and some of that sort of fancy stuff to actually make the process more effective? So can we figure out, you know, more interesting ways to find the right journalist to target than typically an agency would? So let me give you an example. So we've actually built a bot um, in, for PR Volt that, that um, builds basically targeting lists in, in a much more powerful way than your traditional media database does. Um, and the way it works is we can, the first thing that we train the bot to do is, is competitive monitoring. So I'll give you an example. Let's say you're a men's shaving line, right? Um, well, there's a bunch of other men's shaving lines, men's shaving products out there that are getting press coverage. Let's say Dollar Shave Club, Harry's, Art of Shaving, right? With a bot, what we do is we can plug in the URL of those, those companies and the bot will go and crawl the web, find all the press coverage that those companies have gotten and find the journalists that wrote them and build a segment in our CRM to target specifically based on journalists that have covered similar products. And that's just laser focus. Cause if you go into one of these media databases, basically you're like, I gotta like the, the, the closest you can get is finding journalists that, that have the interest cluster, like, you know, men's fashion or something like that. Like it, it's just, it, you know, you can't get into the level of detail that you, that, that, that we really want. Um, and then the other thing that we built the bot or trained the bot to do is keyword monitoring. So let's say, um, you know, uh, you want to find any journalist that has, you know, written an article that contains the words essential oils, aromatherapy, and shower. Well, chances are that those, those editors would be pretty good targets for the SEO shower product, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, ba- so finding journalists based on signals from the web, like what are they talking about? Which companies are they writing about? And instead of just like, are they in a database with like, you know, at some point they've raised their hand saying I'm interested in X, Y, Z topic. Um, so that, that's, that's just an example of how we're also trying to use tech to, to improve the way, pro, you know, um, agencies, you know, run PR today. Um, but yeah, overall, Chris, what we're trying to do is help startups, um, you know, tell their story, get interest, get press coverage, um, and then ideally utilize that press coverage in their marketing funnel um, and and really drive results um, above and beyond what they might be doing today. Man, I I have to tell you that I um, usually when I podcast or host a podcast or interview somebody that I'm usually thinking of questions to ask them throughout <laughs> the podcast. And you know what? Like this is probably one of the first and only podcasts that I've actually took notes while you were speaking. <laughs> to so that was incredible. No I, yeah. I love that, man. That is such great stuff. And so... Well, thanks for sharing. And then, no, then no, I, yeah. I want to ask you that you wanted to share a bit about now, now you guys are running two companies at once. Do you keep your team separate for SEO shower and uh, PR volt teams? I, separate? I, I do. I would say 90, 90 to 95% separate. So the, okay. the, the, the full-time people that work on, on PR volt and the full-time people that work on SEO shower are separate. Mm -hmm. Um, we do have some admin resources, um, and some VAs that, that, um, go between, um, and, and some, some rock stars that I've found over the years that, um, I'm just comfortable with. (laughs) And, uh, you know, I know that they're really dependable and sometimes I want to, you know, they, they understand like sometimes there are systems that we've built in SEO shower or systems that we built in PR vault. I'm like, Hey, we need to take, that's working really well over there. Let's, let's build out the same system in SEO shower. So sometimes there is value in having people that are, you know, um, can, can go across the business lines. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to keep the, the, the sort of, um, employees, the, high, the senior level people really focused on their goals for that specific company. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect sense. Perfect sense. Yeah. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs don't recommend doing this. I'm curious if you found any challenges yourself running two companies at the same time. Um, yeah, I, I, I also don't recommend it, (laughs) um, but sometimes you can't avoid it, right? Like, you know, PR Volt came up as an idea and it felt like too good of an idea to not do. Um, 
And it also felt like, um, you know, there could be synergies between the two companies. And, um, you know, we get really cool, innovative clients for PR Volt. And sometimes I learn from them and I can take stuff that I learned from them and roll them into my SEO shower business. So, you know, if you are in, in a position where you are doing more than one, it's not an enviable position, but there are benefits from it because you can take learnings from one company or take, you know, the people that you meet from one company and, and use that for your other for your other business as well. So you have to think about the opportunity um, of having two at, at once, um, I think it, it is very important. Um, and then I think that the challenge really is in carving out your time. And what I've found is, it's it's gotten much more important for me to um, to delegate really well um, and to find really dependable resources for every facet of the company. In the past, when it was SEO Shower, a lot of the times I was wearing all the hats or wearing a lot of the hats, and that's great because you're just, at the beginning you're you're learning everything and you need to do that. But when you're especially when you have two, uh, you, you can't do that, um, and you have to get really really um, good at um, finding dependable resources and entrusting you know them with the responsibility of executing on something and making sure that you set up the KPIs for them and like hey this is what you got to do this is the process that's worked in the past let's go right um, that's really the, the key is not trying to do everything yourself because with two you, you can't I actually had quite a few entrepreneurs on the podcast that have used remote teams and actually moved to a more location-based team and then vice versa people that had location-based teams and moved to remote teams you guys are fully remote for both the companies um, what are some of the benefits uh, that you have found working with a remote team yeah great question i think for for me it's, i'll take the, the pr vault example is, is a good one so <clears throat> so the way we're structured is um all of our campaign managers um, are remote distributed, obviously, and uh, um, and they're in, in you know in the United States or Canada. Um, if I was if our company was totally located in Los Angeles, granted, there's a good talent pool in Los Angeles, but I would be restricted when when we're trying to find great campaign managers to manage PR campaigns for our clients. Uh, I would be restricted to one location. The, to me, the the I think there are really two fundamental benefits of, of being of operating remote, but but one is being able to tap into a much broader talent pool, um, you know, and and having the pick of the litter. Whereas if if we were located all in, in LA, it would just be just finding people that live in LA, and that would restrict us I mean, from from finding folks that are probably really great at doing what they do. I think the second thing is um, is the sort of productivity piece, um, and this isn't always the case because sometimes you can hire somebody that's remote and they just sit on their on their butt and that's not great but i think if you're if you're smart and you set up the kpis and you set up the processes and you have a system in place to check that people are doing what the, that what they should be doing um generally i feel that people are more effective workers when you give them the freedom to work where they want to work mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and that that's a, that's a huge benefit right um as opposed to making somebody drive an hour a day to come and work next to you sit next to you um i, I don't see the huge the huge benefit of that and then i think the third thing is you know when you when you have a remote team um you know, people are willing to give up a little bit in terms of compensation just to have that, you know, benefit. So I think there's also, um, you know, the, the the overhead, the cost, and not having to have a huge office to, to maintain all these people in one place. I think that's the sort of third, more tertiary um, benefit. But I think the, the, the first two are, are the more primary, which is being able to access a broader talent pool um, and then the productivity gains that you'll get from having a remote team. When you're hiring specifically for remote employees, what are the things, because I'm guessing you're probably doing a Skype call or, some, or Zoom call or something like that, what what are some of the thing key indicators that you guys need, that the employee needs to hit to make sure that they're going to be a good remote employee? Well, so one thing that we, we, we look for is if they've worked remotely in the past, um, that's obviously usually, usually a good sign because they have experience working with remote teams. It's not a you know, hard and fast rule. Um, the other is that they that they actually actively want to work remotely. Um, there are a lot of people that that actually want that experience. If they're looking for, you know, a full time job in their city or something like that, they're not actively looking for the remote experience, and it may be you know a mismatch once they they actually take the job. So, trying to find people that are either ha either have had experience working remotely or are actively seeking a remote type of of work um, or flexible type of work is usually what we go for. So, for example. Um, 
you know, our, our director of client campaigns, um, she previously before working for PR Volt worked for another company that was completely 100% remote distributed. So when she came to PR Volt, it was just very natural for her. She had al already been working on Slack. She had already been conducting team meetings over Skype and stuff like that. So, um, and she also had a lot of team building tricks up her sleeve, um, you know, that, that she brought in with, with the experience of her previous company. So I think those are the key things, Chris. That's great. Yeah. Peter, I think I could go on for another hour with you, but we're going to have to wrap up. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, no, this is great. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, good. Thank you. So, thank you so much for like really being open and vulnerable and, and sharing some of the um, tips and tricks that you guys are doing with your companies. I think that's really valuable to entrepreneurs and it actually makes some of the best podcasts because people can hear about, you know, things they can apply to their businesses, but also see if they want to use your business and services as well. Thank, thank you very much for sharing all that uh, if the I listeners want to reach out and learn more about seo showers because actually i was thinking i could buy that for my mom for christmas great, or, great, or, great <laughs> gift yeah or, or pr volt um where's the best place or or just follow you um where's the best place they could do that at? yeah so there's a couple things we can put these in the show notes um so uh i'm my email i'll just give out my email too so it's peter at prvolt.com for pr volt and then for seo shower it's pfreeze at seo shower.com p-f-r-i-i-s and then um my i have a clarity um so clarity.fm slash peter dash freeze and uh, my twitter handle is spirit freeze s-p-i-r-i-t-f-r-i-i-s so those are the best places to uh reach out Excellent. And yeah, we'll put all those links in the show notes. Again, thank you so much, Peter, for hopping on the mic with us. And no, my pleasure. And we're going to wrap up there. Listeners, thank you guys for joining us once again, and we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye, everybody. Hey, listeners, thanks for joining us once again. We wanted to remind you about our high-performance productivity coaching and our annual Get Shit Done Live Retreat in Thailand. Both are designed for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs to get a lot of work done rapidly. And whether you need some personal coaching while working away at home or a retreat in Thailand where you can get out of your normal routine and surround yourself with other successful entrepreneurs, we have those options for you. Check out all the details at thebusinessmethod.com. And we'll see you on the next podcast.